there was a grandma and her grandson on the beach. And the grandson was playing in the water, splashing around, and the, the grandmother was watching from the shore. And all of a sudden, a big wave came on, and she looked over, and the wave receded, and her grandson was gone. And she knelt down, and she started praying, and she's like, God, bring him back. God, she starts visioning him being there, playing again. She starts pleading and begging and, and holding and doing affirmations and, and holding all these thoughts. And she hears a loud voice, enough already. And another big wave comes, and there's her grandson standing right there, back into the water, playing again as if nothing had happened. And the voice says, I brought your grandson back for you. Are you satisfied? And she says, well, he did have a hat, you know. <laughs> I love that because, you know, how many times do we pray and pray and pray and think we, never get, we don't get our prayers answered, not in the way we want them to be answered. We're never satisfied. This week I was reading from... Stir, the, stir up the gift of God. Stir up the gift of God. And this comes from the second book of Timothy. Chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, it says, I remind you to stir up the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Stir up the gift. I had to start thinking about started meditating on that and what does that mean to me and stir up is is another word in a later version of, of this scripture it says rekindle the gift of God rekindle so it's a fire it up light it up rekindle it this gift of God bring life to it and what is the gift of God but the greatest gift of God f that we have is a power of our thoughts that we have this ability to think and change our lives. So stir up the gift of God. L put a fire under those thoughts, not those thoughts of, th the thoughts of God, not the thoughts of lack or limitation or fear, but the thoughts of God. Stir up, stir them up, mix them up, set them on fire, give them new life. And the laying of the hands, where it says stir up the gift of God that is within you, through the laying on of my hands. The laying of my hands is through an act of living faith. So stir it up. Think it. Stir it up. Give it life. Those thoughts. And then act on those thoughts. Go out into the world and be the hands and feet of God. That's unity's fifth principle, that we act. It's not enough to just study this and know it and understand it, but we need to act on it. It's an outer of expression of what's within us. Eric Butterworth says there's a secret to everything, meaning there's an underworking of everything. We don't see seeds in the ground doing their work and, and, and becoming sprouts until they come through the soil. Just as we don't see spirit working in our lives within us, we see the effects of it. We see the effects of us taking action on spirit working in our lives. In Mary Magdalene Revealed, which I have quoted from many times, I'm not quoting from her today, by Ma Megan Watterson, she talks about a seed bank. And I wasn't aware that there was such a thing. There's a seed bank in Norway, buried in a mountain in Norway, of over 800,000 varieties of seeds of plants and vegetables and bushes and trees and fruits and everything that we would need in case of mass destruction. It's both sad that we would need that, that we think we would need that, and think about the potential. Think about the potential that 800,000 seeds have to rebuild our planet, 
to rebuild vegetation on our planet. It can give you hope if you look at it from that way, from the potential. That same seed is within us, that same seed of thought. Stir up the gift of God. Stir up those thoughts, those thoughts that are within us that we don't see with our physical eyes. But we can hear the voice of God, and we can nurture those seeds. We have this potential within us to create anything, to do anything, to be anything. And it can grow. We can grow in so many different ways. And that's what this stir up the gift of God. Stir it up. Light it up. It all begins within us, which is unseen, in the secret. It begins with a knowing of our own innate power, our divinity. And we first see everything. Everything is first a thought. Your thought is your life is the name of this particular chapter where Eric Butterworth is talking about this. Your thought is your life. If you don't know what your thoughts are, look at your life. It'll tell you where your thoughts have been. You know, vines get disciplined to grow a certain way through the use of a trellis. And we can use a trellis in our lives as well as a discipline to have a spiritual practice. As long as the focus is not on the trellis, it's on the growth, it's on the seed, it's on the, the part that needs to grow. If we focus on the trellis, we're focusing on our habits and our patterns. But the molding of our mind starts very small with a single thought. This is Unity's third principle, that we change our experience of life through our thoughts, through our feelings, through our beliefs. Jesus was revolutionary. He came to open our minds to this. He came that we would see the goodness within ourselves. He came to not worship the trellis, but the seed, the vine. Don't get attached to the trellis. Don't get attached to the methods, but to the mission. In Jesus' time, his language was Aramaic. And Aramaic is a really rich language. It has many, when you speak in Aramaic, it can have many layers of meanings. And that's why I think people didn't understand Jesus a lot. They were only looking at the literal. You are the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth? What does that mean, I'm the salt of the earth, in Jesus' time? They didn't see it the way he saw it. They didn't, and we still don't, and many of us, want to take scripture literally. That's why I love Unity's rich, rich practice of metaphysically interpreting the Bible. So salt is a flavoring, just a little bit. Just a tiny pinch of salt can flavor a whole pot of soup. Think of that salt as truth and what it can do to our lives. It just starts out in a small amount. All it takes is a little bit. And we start to grow in a new way. We start to grow with new awareness. And the awareness of this truth must be dynamic. It's not static. The truth is static, but the awareness of it is not. It's always interesting to me when I hear people say, I want to grow spiritually. We never grow spiritually. We're, we've got all the spirit within us already there, already present, already infinite. But what we do grow is we grow in spiritual awareness. Our awareness grows of that spiritual, of that divine essence within us. So grow in awareness of the truth. It has to be dynamic. It has to be ever-changing. As we grow, as we learn, as we evolve, as we let that life come through us and experience more life. 
Eric Butterworth says, with all thy getting, we're always wanting to get more, right? We're always wanting to get, get. With all thy getting, get understanding. Know this, at least. Know this, that you have that power within you, that you have all the potential of more than 800,000 seeds, that it's all there within you waiting for you to call it forth, waiting for you to nurture it, waiting for you to allow it to grow. He says this about salt. When you are seasoned with the salt of truth, your own body of knowledge suddenly reveals a new dimension. Man has no existence outside of God, but is the activity of God expressing as man. With this newer insight, you become a seasoning influence in the world. And all it takes is a little bit. Stay focused on that truth. Live your life knowing. We are responsible for what we're aware of. Not what we're not aware of, but things that come into our consciousness, things that we are aware of. We're responsible. A few months ago, I had this idea to to, um, connect people connect women in a women's retreat. And I could have focused on the trellis and I could have done my usual habit patterns and said, oh, but that's not mine to do. But I had the idea. And once I committed to it, all these ideas to, of different activities and things to do in the women's retreat just started pouring through me. It's like once we take that first leap, once we take that first step, spirit is there saying, yes, I've got you. Here you go. Here it is. More ideas, more ideas. And we have to have that courage. As as Paul says in Timothy, we have not a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love. That will get us very far in our lives and in the creation of our dreams, in the manifesting of our dreams. We want to stir up that gift. We want to, as my daughter says, level up. Level up. Stir it up. In the book of Mark, there's a story about a house filled with people. Jesus was in there healing And it was filled, and they were lined up outside, and there were a couple of men carrying a man who was paraplegic on a stretcher, and they couldn't get through the crowd. And so they climbed to the roof. They climbed to the roof of the house with this man on a stretcher and raised the roof and lowered the man in to get near Jesus. We need to raise the roof. That Metaphysically, a house is our consciousness. People and people metaphysically mean our thoughts. So if our, our consciousness is filled of thoughts, it's just crowded, filled of thoughts, we want to raise the roof. We want to let more life flow through. We want to get rid of that limitation that a roof has. Raise the roof. They're raising the roof to get to the Christ. We should be raising our roof to get to the Christ within us. Raise that roof. Get rid of that limitation. We can easily get caught by a glass ceiling and think we can't go any higher. We can't go any deeper. We can't go any farther. This is it for me. But spirit doesn't say that. Spirit doesn't believe that. Spirit is all potential. There's so much more for us to be to do, to have. There's so much more than we're experiencing. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that or working towards that because that is life itself calling, wanting to call through you, wanting to come forth through you. That little desire, that little idea to start so small wants to grow, wants to move you up. Do we let it? We need to start thinking outside the box and let go of those limits. Someone who did that 
in the 14th century was Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was a 13-year-old girl who just wanted to spin her wool and have a nice, quiet life. And then she started getting visions of the Archangel Michael, Gabriel, one of those two. Anyway, and having these visions, the angel, not an angel outside of us. Angels are within us. It's our own guidance speaking to us. And she started having these visions of that she was to lead an army during the Hundred Year War in France. She didn't know how to do that. She was a girl. So she cross-dressed, dressed as a man, and somehow convinced the king to let her lead the army, and she was successful. You don't look to the world for possibilities. Look within for the possibilities, for the potential. That energy arises within us when we align our inner knowing with our guidance and act on our guidance. When we align our personality selves with our higher selves, that's basically prayer. When we consciously decide to connect with or align with spirit, with our deeper, highest, most beautiful, precious selves, that's within each one of us. Spirit is always, always inviting us to do that. Most of the times we think of prayer as a last resort. Many of us will think of prayer as a last resort. There were some sailors at sea, and they were godless sailors. They didn't believe in God, except they knew one of them did. So they're at a sto- they have, having a storm on the sea, and, the, and all the, his mates say to this one guy who they thought of as a prayerful, prayerful man, you got to help us. you got to help us. you got to pray to your God to get us out of the storm. And the guy said, no, I haven't been to church in years. That God's not going to hear me. And he's, they're like, no, no, we're at our last resort. We're going to drown if you don't do something. And so the guy gets up and in his loud, loud voice says, God, you haven't heard with, from me for 15 years. And if you calm this storm, you won't hear from me for another 15. <laughs> I promise. (laughs) And so many of us, that's how prayer can be. It can be just a sporadic idea when we're trapped, when we're feeling we're at the edge of life. But we're invited to allow it to be part of our daily lives. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Constantly bring those thoughts back to spirit. Stir up the gift of God. Set them on fire. Set those thoughts on fire. So are you willing to stir up the gifts of God? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to plant the seed and nurture it? And stay focused on the vine and not decorating the trellis? What is that gift of God that longs to come forth through you and as you? What thoughts are circulating? What thoughts of God? If you're not sure, Paul says this in Philippians. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Those are the types of thoughts. Those are the things we want to keep, repent, return to in consciousness. That's prayer. Aligning that. Allowing life to come through us. That spirit, life. In 1962, Rick Hoyt was born. He was born a quadriplegic and also had cerebral palsy. And the doctors told his parents that 
they should just put him in an institution that he would never be able to speak, he would never be able to walk, his life was not gonna be worth much, and to just put him in his, an institution. But his parents disagreed. They saw their little boy as merely a challenge to overcome, not an impassable barrier. When Rick was 12 years old, his parents had been working on, with a technology company to, to create a, a communicator. Somehow he would, he would be able to, I don't know if press the buttons or, I, I wasn't clear on that, but a communicator where it would bring a voice through the mic, through the speaker after Rick did some, some kind of action. And so it was finally done. After two years of working on this, they wanted to hear their son's voice. And the first words he uttered were, go Bruins. <laughs> and the parents knew, they knew that there was a bright mind within this body. That this body that looked so broken and so unable to do what you and I can do every day was alive was there. In 1977, when Rick was 16, he was in high school, there was a, he had heard about a college student in his town who was injured and they were raising money for him. And there was a race, a five mile race. And Rick said to his dad, Dick, I wanna run in that race. And Dick, being the wonderful father that he was, believing in his son, knowing that Dick saying to himself, well, I only run a couple of miles a week just to keep the weight down. I don't know if I can do five miles, but okay, I'll push your chair. After that race, Rick told his father, when I'm running, I don't feel like I'm handicapped. This started 20 years of racing, 20 years of Dick push chair. They did marathons. They did the Boston Marathon. Dick had to, of course, find a lighter wheelchair because Rick weighed about 90 pounds. They didn't stop there. They, st they started doing triathlons. And Dick found a way to strap his son, his 90-pound son, on his back while he swam two miles. Dick had never been a swimmer. But Dick did this for his son, for the love of his son, for that life force that he felt and he saw in Rick whenever they did this. They, they finished in top 50%, top 25% top many times in their category, which is amazing. They just kept running. And Dick said that every race, no matter how we finish, is a victory. It's a victory for their lives. Rick was the first quadriplegic, non-speaking quadriplegic to graduate college. He had a bright mind. This is what's possible when we stay focused on the potential, and not what the world is telling us. Each of us has this potential. Each of us has this power within us, and we just have to acknowledge it and use it and share it. Anything is possible. We need to have a mindset of possibilities not a mindset of limits. Get in touch with that part of yourself that's calling this forth, because it always is, if we're willing to listen, if we're willing to see the blessings. It's always there. Rick's father saw it, and Rick saw it. Rick's father just passed away, and this past March. But what a gift he gave his son. 
one of, of allowing life to come forth. I want to close with a quote from Discover the Power Within You. It says, prayer is not something we do to God, but to ourselves. It is not a position, but a disposition. It is not flattery, but a sense of oneness. It is not asking, but knowing. It is not words, but feeling. It is not will, but willingness. Have that willingness to stir up the gift of God by consciously connecting to source and actively living your faith. Peace be with you. Namaste.